When I say halogen lamp, what comes to mind? Is it something like this? Or even this? Or maybe this? Well, they're actually all halogens. But in that case, what does incandescent mean? And what's a basking lamp? Do we use them for heat? Do we use them for light? What about infrared? Well, that's the topic of today's video. So let's get stuck in. This all starts with a single term, incandescence. And for something to be incandescent, it needs to meet one bit of criteria. And that is that it emits electromagnetic radiation, that's light in one form or another, because it's hot. And because of that broad definition, we can actually categorize quite a few lamps under this category. So we've got things like ceramic heat emitters, heat projectors, heat lamps, basking lamps, halogen lamps, even old fashioned household light bulbs. And I better put this back. And because of that definition, we can say that some lamps are definitely not incandescent, such as LEDs. Now, annoyingly, technical definitions don't always translate perfectly into everyday life. So when you hear someone talk about incandescent lights, they're usually referring to a tungsten coil filament bulb. I mean, I'm guilty of doing this myself. I will always say incandescent light when actually what I'm talking about is a tungsten coil. Now you've probably seen a tungsten coil before. It's a technology that's been around for decades and it's the sort of technology we used to use to light up our homes. The technology is actually pretty simple. You pass an electrical current through the bulb, the tungsten coil shorts and heats up, and as it heats up, it produces light. Hey presto, you've got a light bulb. But more on that bit later. A very similar technology actually works with many other lines of products, such as heat projectors. Just instead of using a tungsten coil, they use a carbon coil or a carbon alloy based coil. And ceramic heat emitters also work in the same way. It's just that that coil is hidden inside. Instead of a clear glass envelope, you've got this casted ceramic case. And it's the similarities between these products that puts them all technically under the definition of an incandescent light source. But as we said, we know they're different and we know they work differently as well. Put a tungsten based incandescent lamp and a carbon based incandescent lamp, turn them both on and you can immediately see what the difference is. This one lights up and this one doesn't, but it is on. And I'll turn that off now so it doesn't get too warm in here. That difference you saw is actually because of the temperature of the filament inside. This tungsten filament burns hotter than a carbon filament, for example. And if we were to take a special laser thermometer that could read elements, we could shine it at the bare filament of the tungsten filament lamp and we'd get a reading of around 2200 celsius, that's around 4000 fahrenheit. But when we're talking about it in terms of physics and science, we actually refer to the Kelvin value. And the Kelvin value is around 2500. And we know when it's turned on, it emits visible light. Actually, most of its output is in the non-visible infrared light range. And we take a look at a heat projector, for example. And I know this from speaking to suppliers and the actual factories that manufacture the carbon filament thread inside. And they're designed to work at around 500 Celsius. That's around 900 Fahrenheit, which if we're talking about Kelvin, because we're scientists, we're looking at around 800 Kelvin. And we can see when we turn it on that the amount of visible light is much, much lower, very negligible. And what we're seeing here is a direct connection between the temperature of the filament and the amount of visible light that it gives off. And this is the basis for the phenomenon we call black body radiation. The proportions of visible light to invisible infrared light changes as the temperature of the filament changes. And a hotter filament means more visible light. Notice how I'm saying visible light? Well, that's because the vast majority of the output is still invisible infrared light. And where infrared is concerned, it's a type of light. It's not heat. This invisible infrared light is actually really important. It's one of the key components of basking behavior that we see in reptiles, mammals, birds. And in terms of what we get on Earth from the sun, it makes up around 40 to 50% of the sunlight radiation. Now, that percentage and ratio changes throughout the day because of something called atmospheric attenuation. But generally, 40 to 50% is the agreed amount of infrared in sunlight. And the vast majority of that infrared, we term infrared A. And it's this basking behavior under infrared A that gives us the term basking lamp. Although personally, I don't really like this term because basking in sunlight implies a full spectrum and you really don't get that under a single lamp. Now I spoke about that quite a few times on a different video, so I'll let you watch that one instead. But generally for something to be basking, it needs to be under the full spectrum of light in my opinion. And it doesn't necessarily do that with an incandescent lamp on its own, but I digress. Generally, when we say basking lamp, we're referring to a lamp that produces significant amounts of infrared A for an animal to exhibit basking behaviors under. And because of this black body radiation stuff we spoke about earlier, we can actually accurately predict which lamps produce sun-like levels of infrared A and which ones don't. And by far, the ones with the most appropriate infrared A output 
are the ones with the hottest filament, the tungsten filament lamps. Use a lamp with a lower filament temperature, such as a heat projector or a ceramic heat emitter, and you essentially have none of that basking radiation, and that's despite what you might see online. So basking lamps are those with a tungsten filament. Then you might ask yourself, what's a halogen? This is another one of those technical terms that has become diluted as it enters general conversation. The components of a halogen lamp are pretty much identical to that of a standard tungsten lamp. Just instead of the tungsten being encased in a glass envelope like this filled with an inert gas, it's encased in a small capsule like this filled with another chemical called halogen gas. There's some pretty cool chemistry that goes on inside a halogen capsule. Essentially what's going on is the halogen gas helps keep the tungsten filament burning hotter for longer. There's a little bit more to it than that, but that's essentially the gist for today. And like a standard bulb, if you take this capsule, run an electrical current through there, the tungsten gets hot and you get light, just like you do with a standard incandescent lamp. Put that capsule inside a highly reflective envelope and you get a halogen lamp like this. And for every other practical purpose, it's essentially the same as a standard tungsten filament lamp. The main differences we see in day-to-day -day life are the general size of the lamp. Now, we tend to see that halogen capsules get put inside a PAR-30 or PAR-38 body as part of the manufacturing process. Those are the sort of lamps that we tend to see in animal keeping. Wow, we've covered quite a bit there. We have ceramic heaters and heat projectors, both of which are not suitable for basking radiation. We have halogen lamps and normal heat lamps both of which are a type of tungsten filament lamp, and they also give off good quality basking radiation. And all of these are incandescent. Although most of the time in general conversation, these lines can get quite blurred. So don't be shocked if you see that the standard heat lamps and the halogens are often mistaken for one another. And also don't be shocked if people don't consider heat projectors and ceramic heat emitters to be incandescent lamps. And essentially what this can mean is that in general conversation, someone could say tungsten, halogen, basking lamp, spot lamp and they could all in theory mean the same thing. Now whether that's right or wrong is up for debate but this is just one of those puzzles of the English language that we're going to have to deal with. But that doesn't mean that all tungsten lamps are identical. For example two 100 watt incandescent lamps from the exact same company could have a very different output and understanding this output helps us decide on a lamp to choose for our animal. Remember what we're trying to do here is light our animal with this invisible light, this invisible infrared A. So we don't want to choose a lamp based on the temperature that a basking spot reaches. Instead, we want to base our lamp off of the radiation that it gives off. We want to make sure that there is enough infrared A to cover our animal in its entirety. And on that basis, can you guess what I think is the number one reason people don't provide adequate infrared A in the basking area? Whilst you ever think, I do want to say thank you so much again for watching. I'm working on finishing up some reporting on some compact fluorescent lamps that we see quite a lot in the pet world. Now, those results will be available for free on my website, www.tabascus.co.uk. To keep those reports and all the data free, I primarily pay out of my own pocket. Now, this means going out, buying lamps, testing them in my own time. That is when I'm not testing for some of the biggest brands in the world. And as much as I love it, there is a cost involved. The data will be free forever, but if you do want to help by just donating a few pennies, you can enter www.tabascus.co.uk forward slash donate and every tiny little bit does help go towards buying and testing these lamps. There's no obligation of course, but every single penny does really help. Did you manage to guess what I think is the number one reducer of infrared in an enclosure? It's dimming. Just think about what we know so far. We know that lowering the temperature of a filament reduces the amount of infrared air that it outputs. Well, dimming a lamp reduces the temperature of the filament. And because of this, it's really important that we choose a lamp that's the right wattage for our setup so that we minimize the amount of dimming that we do. I always say it's better to run a 50 watt lamp at 100% than it is to run a 100 watt lamp at 50%. But then choosing between the different 50 watt lamps can also be a puzzle because of course they're not all built the same. For example, remember the little halogen capsule before inside the body? Well, it changes the output of the lamp depending on where the halogen capsule is in the body of the lamp. Take it further towards the back and you may have a narrower beam. Bring it to the front and you may have a wider beam. The way the light bounces around the inside of the body, depending on the position of the capsule, is called the parabolic reflector effect. And this placement changes the lamp's output dramatically in some cases. One lamp may have a very wide, broad output. One lamp may have a really narrow beam that's potentially too strong for many setups. So just because they both have 50 watts on the box, they may be very, very different lamps. It even happens in those standard tungsten lamps. We have some that have a narrow double reflector and some that have a broader, wider reflector. This just changes the shape of the beam from the lamp and sometimes you get a nice wide output and sometimes you get a spot. Perhaps one of the biggest factors and most often forgotten about factors of changing the beam shape of a lamp is to do with the lens or the face of the lamp. We tend to find that acid etched ones like this one here 
tend to have a wider, more broader spread, as do prismatic lenses on halogen lamps. A lamp with a clear face, like this one here, is a surefire way to produce a really uneven spread of infrared AT on them all. As a general rule of thumb, I say stay clear of clear face lamps. It's this vast array of beam shapes and lamp shapes that can make your job as an animal keeper not so easy. Which is why I call on manufacturers to have this sort of data available to the consumer at the point of purchase, either on the box or on the website. Some sort of information on the spread of the actual lamp itself. No more of these arbitrary triangles with random temperatures on the side of the box. We want to see the actual beam of infrared A coming from the lamp. Because the animal keeping community can be very scientific, we actually have data on a lot of these lamps available already online. This means there's usually someone available who can tell you how their experience with a lamp went. The main thing is to remember to focus on the irradiance from the lamp itself. We want to focus on this invisible infrared A and not the temperatures. If someone does recommend a lamp to you, ask them what's the irradiance like. And as for asking for help with any lamp, it's the same as always. Make sure you provide information on whereabouts in the world you live, what kind of animal you're keeping, how far away the animal is going to be from the bulb, what kind of enclosure you've got, what kind of budget you've got. Things like that really help. The more information you provide, the better information you can get back from people. Wow, that was a bit of an information dump. We've looked at irradiance charts, black body radiation, halogen capsules, and we even looked at how you can help decide on what kind of lamp is best for your animal. And there's still so much more to look into and to discuss, but we've only just scratched the surface and this video is already getting quite long. So let's call it a day. Please do leave a comment down below, hit the like button, do all those good things, share the video. Let me know if you have any questions based on incandescent lamps, carbon filament lamps, heat projectors, all those good things, and I will see you when I see you.